Okay. I will get started. I will start slowly, and then hopefully people will get, get settled. Um, this is Rudy Ponzo. I'm here with Peter Rice, and we're going to do a quick uh, overview of Transmart. Um, assuming that at least some of you don't know a lot about Transmart and um, would like to learn a bit. Um, we, uh, if uh, just uh, in, in listening, uh, just to let you know that when, if you're trying to speak to us, you really need to use a microphone. We can't hear um, questions and things if they're out in the audience. So please use the mic um, if you need to talk to us, want to talk about anything. And those okay. of you on Zoom will be able to see you in the chat. Uh, I assume. I don't see the chat, but. I, I've got it open. Okay. All right, so um, just a, a quick history of, of Transmart. Uh, I2B2 started uh, initially uh, to, to gather the information that uh, I know a lot of you are I2B2 users um, and collect that, that data. Um, after uh, a few years using I2B2, uh, the folks at J&J &J wanted to do more uh, with the information, in particular, um, do some broader analysis, looking at you know clinical trials, and bringing in gene expression data, for example. And so they created uh, what I guess at the time they called the translational data mart, which became eventually uh, Transmart uh, back in 2009. And so Transmart's been going since that time. Um, they were building it as an internal project for a while, and uh, decided that there was much too much to do, it was too broad of a system for them to maintain themselves. And so they pushed it into open source uh, and uh, it sort of languished there a bit because um, there wasn't really uh, much, you know, people pushing it enough. And so um, we, we actually pulled together the, the Transmart Foundation. Uh, the Transmart was picked up by the Etrix uh, IMI project as one of their core technologies that they were using. Uh, and so that really was the, the, the start of Transmart really having a, a lot more popularity and a lot of people using it um, back in 2017. Then since, you know, there were, there was a lot of similarities uh, and, and from that, since they both sort of started uh, with similar basics, uh, bringing I2B2 and Transmart together, we, we merged the two, uh, the Transmart Foundation with the I2B2 Foundation uh, with the expectation that these would, would drive closer together, which uh, unfortunately they didn't do right away. But um, with the, the funding that we've got from Dell over the last couple of years, we've actually been working harder to to reintegrate Transmart and I2B2, something that we continue to build on. Uh, and we're now looking at um, a, a new release is about to be to come out from Transmart calling 19.1. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I know Peter talked about it yesterday. But we'll we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well as we get get going here. So, um, Transmart can handle a lot of different data types um, in terms of you know clinical data, clinical trials, um, different types of, of organisms. It, it handles lots of different expression data. You can bring data in from GEO and TCGA, uh, the proprietary data sources, um, microarray data, uh, RNA seq, uh, et cetera. And uh, all this information can be brought into Transmart. Uh, and then we have tools um, that you can use um, to, uh, to query this information, uh, a subset, make subsets, uh, and then do all types of analysis um, with it. And, and Peter will, will hit on some of that. But it, uh, you know, it, it means that uh, it, this is a, a very um, um, broad tool in terms of what you can do the types of data that you can bring in and uh, the sorts of analysis that, that you, can, you can use. Um, we also have spent a lot of time trying to make uh, public data available within Transmart. Uh, this means, you know, besides being able to bring in your own proprietary information, uh, we have a lot of, of data sets uh, like from GEO, uh, some TC TCGA and others. Um, we've brought in a lot of information um, that um, you know, you can when you open up Transmart, you can often find some data of interest that you can at least get started on and look at, even with a new, you know, brand new project. Uh, and so, it's been uh, it it, uh, it it actually gives you know gives you some starting point to be able to look at some stuff uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and 
within the system, you know, we have data dictionaries and ontologies that uh, are already uh, also built in that um, you really can get, get started relatively uh, efficiently uh, as you start a new project. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who's going to go through a lot more of the detail in terms of what you have and what you can do with, with Transmart. And you know, obviously, uh, if there are questions along the way, we can certainly try to answer those. Um, but again, please, let's use the mic you know, if we do. So Peter, you want to pick up? Thanks very much, Rudy. So you'll see that uh, this looks like the familiar tree that you see in, in ITB2. One difference in Transmart is that we show the, the counts up front. Um, Transmart uses true counts, so it's not a case of doing a query and getting an obfuscated number. Transmart is complete uh, trials. We know who was in the trial, and uh, yeah, when you do analysis of the trial, you want to see the, the real numbers and the real analysis. So slightly different approach in the, the interface. We have numeric data. In this case, the uh, survival time in months is uh, is either a, a whole number of months or it's a, a floating point number. Um, under cell type, we have um, text data, or we call it categorical data. So we have a set of, uh, of text strings at that level for those nodes. Uh, so you can pick uh, either of those cell type um, categories and drag those into queries. Also in Transmart, we have high dimensional data. That's the gene expression data where you have data for thousands of, of genes or probes on an expression array. And uh, you can analyze those for the, uh, let's say, patients of interest. Um, they may be patients, they may be cell lines, they may be organoids. Um, they still have a patient ID. OK, next slide, Rudy. So you can do analyses of these, and this this one is a, a heat map. So data is extracted for, uh, in this case, I think just one subset, and then a heat map is uh, is generated showing different expression levels uh, for the genes in the uh, the set of uh, subjects that you've uh, selected. And so you you choose the uh, the subset by doing a query, and then you launch. Uh, the advanced workflows and, and run the heat map. And there are various clustering options for heat maps. Um, and you can also run, I think this one's been run in Smart R. There's an interactive um, option as well. Uh, if you run with Smart R, then you can mouse over and get some more information about the, the various cells. And you can also change the clustering on the fly. Next slide. So that's a the current set of um, analyses that you can do with the advanced workflows. Uh, you can do a subset of those with uh, the Smart R interactive analysis. Um, in the final stages of the Etrix project, they did actually make Smart R um, versions for all of the others, but they haven't been fully tested. If anyone's interested, we have versions that we could put into Smart R and try. Uh, next slide. So the kind of things that you can do in, in Transmart, you can browse through the studies that you have and you can choose which studies you want. Um, we have uh, the option to load metadata for all of the studies that you have in Transmart. Um, you can then query those for studies re related to particular disease or studies done in particular countries by particular um, laboratories. Once you've selected your study, um, in Transmart, you're dealing with a complete study. So rather than looking to build a cohort, you have your cohort, you've done the study. You are now looking at comparing two subsets within the, the study, depending on the study design. So you choose a comparison um, um, cohort and uh, a control and compare those and see what you could uh, find out about changes in gene expression or changes in any other data. Um, compared to some disease condition. A side effect of that is uh, diagnosis in Transmart tends to be just a fixed field in the, the tree that says this patient had diabetes or this patient was normal. Um, there's not much point wading down a, a deep tree within the study. Um, all, all terms in the tree for Transmart are under the, the top node of the study. So you have age and other information demographics within the study. 
So you'll, you'll find we abbreviate diagnoses um, because it's just basically a yes or no at this level. So you can have um, subject clinical data for, for real patients. You can have model organism data. Um, so you have mouse strains where you have um, a choice of cell lines from various species. Um, we had with the COVID data, we had a lot of monkey um, experiments done on monkeys, which turned out to be just um, monkey cell lines. It was just green monkey cell lines. No monkeys were actually involved in the experiment. Um, makes it interesting deciding what species you have, which you need for the genes. And then, yeah, you don't have ages or any other demographic information that would be useful. Uh, you also get some sample data. So information about the samples were they after five hours, seven days or whatever time intervals typically. Uh, also treatment. So some have been treated with particular ways and others are just the controls. And the expression data can come from Geo Gene Expression Omnibus at uh, NCBI, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and various other sources. We've had them donated by the pharmaceutical industry and made public. Um, and various projects. Um, Etrix was supporting a bunch of other um, IMI projects. There are medical informatics projects across Europe. And uh, they would often have a, a transmart server with their data on at the end of the project. Um, and it may or may not have been publicly available, depending on the conditions. Remember, we had one project in Germany that could only show, only have the data maintained in Germany and had problems getting access outside. So that was kind of private. Um, and they couldn't change the permissions. Um, but yeah, different states of various transport servers around the, the world. But there were 40 plus projects that were supported by Etrix all using uh, Transmart. And uh, the data could be microarrays in the early days. More recently, um, proteomics data and RNA-seq data, where you use some sequencing um, technology and sequenced counts for uh, messenger RNAs. Uh, that can get a little bit complicated in Transmart. In the early days, the platform for a microarray was the, the GPL um, gene platform from GEO. And that was a list of probiotics that were mapped to genes, which was fine. When you get to the RNA-seq data and you look in GEO, the platform is a sequencing machine. And you could be sequencing monkey genes, mouse genes, human genes. So it doesn't make sense to treat that as the platform in Transmart. So we've changed in 19.1 and we use yeah, human genes, monkey genes, monkey ensemble genes or something like that as the platform. And we, we ignore what sequencing technology was. OK. Um, Next slide. So yeah, we have more than 300 publicly curated studies. A lot of those came out of the Etrix project, and others were contributed by um, folk like Rancho, who were um, early contributors to the open source uh, data curation. There are multiple geo platforms, particularly these are for the, the gene expression, um, and for RNA seq kits. It's the gene collections from various species. So for the COVID data, we had, I think, 10 species involved. We've had a bunch of uh, Cancer Genome Atlas studies contributed by pharmaceutical industry partners and academics. We've got a, a bunch of test data sets that we use to validate um, their fake data. So I was having fun with 19.1 trying to actually decide what the, the browse tab data should be for those. Uh, some of those I just had to pick a disease and uh, go with it. The data didn't actually match any obvious disease at all. Um, we've had curated uh, some 500 COVID studies in a project with Dell over two years, and uh, a bunch of other coronavirus studies for SARS and MERS and other coronaviruses. In Transmart, we load up all the genes for human and mouse, and you can add others, but it gets more complicated. Uh, human genes are uppercase, mouse genes are mixed case, and if you add rat, you have a bit more trouble deciding whether it's a rat or a mouse you're looking at. Uh, Unicrop proteins are much easier to pick species. Uh, we have microRNAs and microRNA products, as well as the genes. You can load metabolites and look at pathways. Um, you can use keg or other pathways, depending on what you have available. We use the Medline subject heading terms for diseases um, in annotating metadata. 
So you can type in diabetes and you get type 1, type 2 and so on as, as options and choose your annotation. Next slide, Rudy. Yeah, so in Transmart you have discrete studies. So you, you have your study and underneath you have the data arranged um, with the demographics giving you your, your subject data and so on. Um, Subjects are anonymized patients, or yeah, as I say, they're, they're just cell lines with various treatments. And uh, you can go back to um, the source data, say from GEO, and we provide links to the, uh, the GEO study. You can then have a look and see if it's changed since. Links to PubMed for the citation, or at least we have one citation there, and you can go to GEO to look for others. And we load up all the metadata that we can find in GEO and put that into the Browse tab. And in 19.1, we've extended that so that we, I think, have a complete set of what you can usefully get out of GEO. Next slide. So you can um, run a query against the, the subjects, whatever they are, within a, a trial or a study. It tells you the number of matching subjects. You can look at various data types categorical data types like male and female for, for sex or gender, numerical values like age, and then you can go to the high dimensional data. Um, you can run heat maps looking at all of the gene expression data um, that matches your, your subset of interest, or you can select an individual gene from there and you can look at those subjects, those cells or whatever, that have expression of a particular gene within a particular range. And that becomes part of your query and um, defines your subset. Next slide. Yeah, so that's the, the tree again. So you can you can select from any of these data types. When you do the, uh, the query building, you're building either everything in subset one or building subset one against subset two. So you can just look at a, a subset of your data or you can do um, control uh, patients against those in some disease arm of the trial. And the trials are generally organized as um, public studies and then by disease, or you can arrange the diseases at a higher level. You're, you're fairly free to, to decide how you do those. Um, basically, there's a parameter file that goes into the ETL process and you set the top node and it builds everything underneath that. So you can drag any of the terms from the tree into the first subset box. Um, you can drag them into subset one and subset two, and it will do that as the comparison. Or you can drag them into subset one and then additional criteria in subset two, subset three. And you can uh, include and exclude at each level. Next slide. Uh, once you've done that, you can run summary statistics. This is like the... Uh, the dashboard overview that you get in ITB2, so you can see standard data that would be stored in the patient table, uh, age, sex, race, uh, they're highlighted automatically as uh, pie charts and uh, bar charts. Um, any other nodes that you've included in the query, so if you've queried for some disease property or, or subsets of the trial, um, that will also show up in the uh, summary statistics and you can drag any other nodes across and get a breakdown between the two uh, subsets of, for any of the other uh, properties that you find. There's also a grid view which is a tabular view of the same data so you see all of the uh, all of the rows all of the a row for every uh, subject that you've uh, selected in subsets one and two and you can drag in additional nodes you can sort and hide columns um, sometimes you find that you've got the uh, the sex has been brought in as a standard column and then you also have it as part of the query so you can remove one of those columns to save duplication and uh, take a look through see if the data looks uh, looks about right it's often a good way to validate things when you first load the data so a common problem in transmart is that some of the ages were not numeric um, you get ages like um, under five or something like that. That makes all of your ages then text values. And so you go back to your data and you, you change under five to five or four or something and, and reload. I think Uli noticed some of those in the COVID data. 
if you if you just take data from geo i i now have a list of more than 20 ways to have a non-numeric age in geo that get passed out okay uh, next slide so this is a summary statistics in this case we've um oh i can't see what they are they're all, all female patients i guess we selected female patients in this case uh, for this subset. So we have 22 female patients, um, 11 of them have been infected with SARS and 11 of them are, are mock cases. Um, they may be humans, they may be mice in this case, or they may be ferrets. Uh, if we open the organism that, um, in the um, tree we'd be able to find out, but this is a slide so we can't. Um, the way we curate things for the COVID data, if it says organism, it wasn't human. Um, a lot of the, the previous publicly curated trials said human. And, uh, not sure whether that's useful or not. Okay, next uh, next slide. So here we've got uh, um, at the top of this, we'd actually see what the query was. So the top of the page tells you what the two subsets are, but uh, we've scrolled down here. So we have, uh, we can see the race breakdown. Um, we have Afro-American and Caucasian in at least these subsets that we've got out. There may be some others in the, the overall data. Uh, we selected uh, one gene, PTPN21, and uh, so we've got analysis of PTP, uh, PTPN21 in the, the lung data. And, uh, let me see. Can we see what the selection was? Oh, I think we're just seeing the expression levels for it. It's being dragged in so that we can see the expression levels in the summary statistics. If it was in the query, I think we'd see there what the, the query was, what range we were selecting. So you can see that in one subset, this gene is more highly expressed than in the other. And they, they appear as the box plot on the right, and they appear in two different colors on the left. One color for subset one and one color for subset two. Okay, so that way you can pick this gene as being one of interest just from looking at the data before you do something like a heat map. Next slide. So this shows the grid view, and uh, yeah, here. So say if you if you select for female, you get female in the sex column, and you also get female as I've selected females from the search. So you can, if if you need space on the screen, you can remove one of those and just. Uh, just remove uh, the sex column and keep the male and female columns because it's easier then to see which is in which subset. And you can you can sort in ascending and descending order. Um, there are various um, tricks in there to make sure that if there are various places with the same node name, so you, they might be different time intervals, then the columns are uh, expanded to, to show the, uh, the shortest unambiguous tail end of the uh, the path. Okay, next slide. So these are the advanced workflows. They run, uh, each of them runs a, an R script. You get your results as images, which you can download, and as tables, which you can uh, save the data from. There are various um, array um, hybridization um, methods that were added by the uh, eTrix, uh, sorry, by the, the trait project. Um, well, we don't have test data for those. It's a little bit hard sometimes to, to test whether they're working successfully. There are a series of, of plots, box plots, correlation plots, and so on. And there are a series of heat maps, um, clustered heat maps, mock selection, and so on. Um, principal component analysis, scatter plots, and, uh, and so on. And more can be added. It's one of the things we'd like to, to try is to add more uh, workflows um, and see what might be useful, um, especially with the, the changing of data. Next slide. So yeah, there's, there's the sample heat map again. Uh, next slide, Rudy. Yeah, so Smart R is the interactive version of the analysis. So it's it's using uh, R to do the analysis. It has a couple of additional methods 
Um, one of them's a little bit strange. It was done for um, one of the eTrix projects. Um, and they said, this must be released as, as open source. And so it was put into Transmark, but it's really hard to find any data that it works with. <laughs> um, it's still there. We have found a found a way to test it. There's a there's a test set that we can use it on. Um, but basically, it's the heat maps and uh, basic graphs of data. But you can then view, you can reanalyze, you can uh, mouse over things and see what the values are on box plots, etc. So where it says the rest are in development, we have them. They just need some testing, and we'll see if uh, we really want to go live with them. If there are any you particularly want in SmartR. Let us know. Next uh, slide. So here's an example of the box plot where we've moused over on the, the right hand side and you can see what the actual values are. They just pop up for you. They're a bit lower down. You can uh, you can see the numbers for the, uh, the error bars and so on. Next slide. Data export is, is rather like summary statistics in the grid view. You select the data that you want. You decide to export the clinical data or the clinical data and uh, maybe gene expression or RNA-seq data. Uh, you can drag any other columns that you, you want to appear in your output. Just drag those nodes across and they'll be added to it. And then you, you save the files to a, a staging area within Transmark and then they can be um, provided through the interface and uh, you can download them onto your PC or whatever you're, you're using. And they, they just come up as uh, tab delimited files. Next slide. So we have our Transmart 19.1 release candidate. It's in beta testing at the moment. There are a couple of things we're looking at and we're updating the, the documentation to match the the latest version and cleaning up the way some of the uh, studies are represented. ETL data loading is much faster and cleaner and simpler. We found a series of um, bottlenecks for very large data sets. And so we've sped up um, clinical data um, in managing the tree for large clinical data loads. It was very slow there. In doing the, uh, the node counts, it was very slow there. And, uh, those have been sped up a hundredfold in some cases. Uh, we've also added some uh, some error checking. So we had users, in, uh, one of our user sites in the States who've been very active in Transmart, the data failed to load. And uh, they, they told me it, it says that this column is not big enough. Yeah, which was true. Um, but it didn't tell them which bit of the data was too big. So I added a test into the script, and basically went through and checked the maximum length of data that was going to go into that column. And if it was too big, it would tell them how many records were too big, um, an example of which was the biggest one. So they can then go and either make the column bigger or fix the data so that everything fits within a, a suitable length. We try not to allow enormously long strings in the database just in case things start getting slower. We've extended the study data in the Browse tab so that all of the fields that you get in GEO and all the things that were originally defined um, when Sanofi contributed that to uh, Transmart 16, they're all now included. Uh, we have Docker containers, which are, uh, are sitting there ready. We've made them from the beta release. We'll make them again from the, uh, the full release. We support Postgres up to Postgres 14, starting from about 9.5, I think, because there are some things that, that we depend on in Postgres that were only available from 9.5. Um, and as you increase to later versions of Postgres, things get more efficient because Postgres has ways of uh, analyzing queries and running them more efficiently. Um, one of the things that appeared around about Postgres 10 or 11 was it started using more than one CPU. Until then, everything was just queued up to make sure that it, nothing ran and conflicted. We've updated all the libraries and the drivers for, for Postgres, Oracle, and so on. And we've rewritten install scripts so that it'll be much simpler and easier to maintain, and we'll add some new operating systems, um, the ones that we know people are using. 
because we can find someone who can test them for us. And the others, I have a, a scrap laptop that I just put a new operating system on and try installing Transmart, and then I can delete it afterwards just to get the, the scripts working. So within reason, we can try any operating system there. Next slide, Rudy. So one of the key things in Transmart 19.1 is with the Dell project, you've now got the full I2B2 data model in there. You can install Transmart, um, and then you can load I2B2 data into it and use it as an I2B2 database. It just has some extra tables, basically, and maybe a couple of extra indexes. But it's it's a standard I2B2 database, and we, uh, Jeff and I, put that together as a demo for AMIA last year. We loaded the I2B2 demo data and showed that you can view that in Transmart, and we loaded some Transmart studies, and you can view those in I2B2. Okay, next slide. Do we have another slide? Or no, we reached the. Yeah. So that's a summary of Transmart. I don't know what, what you'd most like us to do. We're, we're your last entertainment before the, uh, yeah, the closing right. of the session. So do please give us requests. I can demonstrate the query interface or we can talk about the things we'd like to have in Transmart in the future. Yeah, so Rudy and Peter, thank you for that. Uh, let's give a round of applause. We appreciate that. Um, hey guys, we can hear you. <laughs> Oh, yes. yes. We do have uh, microphones set up in the room. If anyone has a question or comment they want, um, if I could ask you to use a microphone. Um, otherwise, Peter and Rudy will not be able to hear you. So we've got a question here. So hi, Peter. Hi, Rudy. Nice to hear you. <laughs> um, can you hear Ulrich OK? okay. Uh, just about. Yes, it's okay. faintly, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going closer. So. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So just an observation after one and a half days uh, seeing I2B2 and Transmart, the observation would be that we are looking at different use cases. So this was very clear to me now, whilst I2B2 is good for querying, for collecting data, for getting some data filtered and then exported and put into R or something else, um, Transmart is completely different because <clears throat> the filtering looks quite the same, the ontology uh, challenges are the same, but then uh, there's some functionality for simple analytics. That's how we coined it in our projects. And I think that's the strength uh, of Transmart. And I want to put a, put a point on the heat map. Uh, so maybe, uh, Peter, you could show the heat map again. Maybe you can show it live. Because there's one feature people should see. Uh, we use it a lot for data review. So we use Transmart for data reviews, uh, for showing data to make sure that the data is integrated correctly. And then people come up with hypotheses. Uh, could you look at the intersection of this uh, clinical data type and of the gene expression data? And um, maybe I could explain it here if you want, uh, because it's interactive. So you can sort the heat map. You can sort them as you like. Uh, you see this line between uh, seven or eight, for example, you just can resort it. And uh, the interactive part spans on the top layer as well, because in the top layer, you could put in clinical data. So you could sort like a male and female, like infected, not infected. You can put in whatever you want in the top section and then sort and, and see if the pattern changes in the gene expression down there. That's what our clinical researchers like a lot. So and this is um, interactive as compared to, you know, exporting a data set and putting it into R. So this you can do together on the fly uh, with your clinicians. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, if you could put subsets, you see the two subsets clearly defined as subsets one and two at the top of the heat map, and you can see whether you've got distinction between them. Yeah, it, this, uh, yeah the, the, uh, I like it a lot. It's a phenotype of phylogenetic tree. So and you can sort it up there, and the uh, rows and columns are sorting accordingly. So this yeah. is yeah. pretty good. Um, second um, and last comment would be the TCGA I like a lot. But I think it's a very rocky road to go down, so I wouldn't know how to display TCGA data in Transmart. This could be really useful if you're looking at um, disease-specific consortia, like on pancreatic cancer. There's a beautiful yeah. uh, TCGA data set on pancreatic cancer. And this would be great if it would be in there 
already. And uh, what we're looking for would be a simple example or a manual um, how to put in DCG data into Transmart, because this is um, a, another strength, I think, uh, to have the local clinical data in there. That's what we already did, the clinical re uh, cancer registry data together with an actual um, external data set. And you can use the that, same. That sounds good, yeah. So uh, requests for documentation are always very helpful. Um, for TCGA, we've had a number of sets that were actually curated more than once, and we can look at alternative ways of doing them. Yeah, they were done by the pharmacy uh, matrix yeah. and also by pharmaceutical partners. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Peter or Rudy? No? How about one more round of applause then for them? Thanks for staying till the end, guys. You didn't even have no, Sean offering you a free dinner this time. <laughs> Sorry, say that again? You, you didn't have Sean offering you a free dinner this time, so thanks for staying till the end. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you both. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Diane, do you want to take us home? So, P Peter and Rudy, I want to thank you guys. Peter, I know it's late there, and I know you had a long funeral week that you had that you went through, and you waited in a really long line this week, and so you're probably tired. So we really appreciate you uh, sticking sticking it out and doing this. Uh -huh. So I, I will toast you all very soon and uh, settle down and relax. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So any other last minute? I kind of said my my final few things before this. And any other qu questions, comments, or anything else from the group that's left? Keith? Well, I was thinking about some of the discussions we had yesterday mm -hmm. about how Transmart has to be created from scratch. And mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good, yeah, definitely a good point. I know we made a lot of progress towards that um, in this last round. So, yeah. Anything else? Well, bravo to the people that lasted to the end. <laughs> bravo to you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Yeah, this was good. Again, again, uh, fill out the survey. Tell us what you think, because we we got to keep tweaking this. You know, a lot. We had double the registrations from the prior years. Not everybody showed up, but quite a few. And then a lot of people like joined Zoom. So. I mean, we had we had a really good turnout. So people are interested. People are, you know, they're active again. So let's keep kind of keep the momentum going. So, all right, everyone. There's folks who are on Zoom. Um, a absolutely. I actually sent um, for all of the registrations. Actually, people even that didn't show up. I, I sent an email just uh, um, probably an hour ago, um, asking to fill out a survey with the link. So everybody has it. So, yeah, and the, and the folks on Zoom, you know, this was, you know, doing an in-person and a um, and a um, remote uh, conferences. It's it's a little bit trickier. So, love to hear your feedback about like what went well and what did not go well about the um, the the um, the webinar. Let's see if we can refine it. Okay, good. All right, let's wrap. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>